just what a huge impact they had. I'm going to highlight some of the amazing women who took part in the orphan train movement. These ladies dedicated their lives to finding homes for children and making sure they stayed safe and happy in those homes. Three of the four dominant placing organizations had strong female presences. The fourth, which was the New York Juvenile Asylum, used male agents and the only females that they, they that were involved, they were basically the matrons of the home. They never left. First, we're going to talk about the American Female Guardian Society. We learned so much about that organization this morning in Kaylee's program. Um, it was a very early organization in New York, and it was run primarily by women. I searched long and hard for the ladies who often appeared in their records. I was only able to find information on a few, and unfortunately, I could not find one picture of any of those ladies. Rachel Penfield and Julima Angel both took children to their new homes. With the AFG, AFGS, the trips were made with just one or two kids. They didn't take out the great big companies like the Children's Aid Society and the Foundling. The ladies of the AFGS believed wholeheartedly in correspondence. If they did not receive a letter from the family or a child, they wrote and asked how the child was. And it, they documented all of that in those history volumes. It'll, it'll say written to on this date. And if there was no letter, then it'll say written to six months later. And then it'll, it, they just keep documenting all of that. And you can just imagine how many letters those ladies wrote. These ladies cared deeply for the children in their care. I found a couple, I like to sit and read those history volumes. Some of them are, the stories are amazing. Some of them make me a little weepy. Um, but I found these two samples of how much these ladies cared for kids. Um, this one over there, it's kind of hard to read. Um, it's for a, a little boy named Lawrence Boyle. Um, he was born in New York on May 11, 1871, and he was surrendered to the home by Miss Annie Strathern, a teacher in the German Industrial School, who stated that the child was given to her by the mother to dispose of as she pleased. She also stated that the mother had utterly forsaken the child, having not having looked after it for several months, that it had at one time been neglected and nearly starved and of late had been left in her school for hours. As she could no longer care for it, she desired that it be adopted from the home. While the babe was sleeping upon the sofa in its soiled and tidy garments, an applicant for an infant boy entered, bringing all the needful credentials, and seeing the child, discovered very soon a resemblance to her own lost baby boy and concluded to adopt him. This paragraph right here says, to this dear little waif, the changes of a day were quite marvelous. In the morning, he was homeless, friendless, neglected, forlorn, and helpless. At evening, he was a beautifully he was beautifully clothed in the finest of home wrought gar garments, made and brought here for his comfort by a tender foster mother, who now folded him to her heart and called him hers. He was indeed a lovely babe, and none who saw him in that, de that day in the calm room after the new mother had dressed him with her own hands will soon forget the striking and pleasant illustration of our homework. So you can see from that that the ladies truly loved the little ones in their care, and that little one hadn't even been there for an hour or two. Um, This one is short, sweet, and a little bit sarcastic, which makes me really love it. Um, this is a little snippet from the history of seven-year-old Amanda, Harriet Amanda Lyon. And all it says is, heard from in August, does not give satisfaction, 
is too warmly attached to her brother. And then in parentheses, and you can tell the lady was a little bit ticked because she was writing a little harder. It says, oh, what a crime, exclamation points. So that was a little bit of sarcasm on their part. I, I kind of like that. Next, we're going to talk about probably the most famous, the, the New York Foundling Asylum. Of the organizations, it was the latest coming. The Sisters of Charity, who operated the New York Foundling Asylum, were pe perhaps the most well-known of the women of the or orphan trains. While most did not know exact names, they knew the Sisters of Charity were the ones placing infants in Catholic homes across the country. Three sisters were credited with the founding of the New York Foundling Asylum. The one given the most credit and the most famous by far was Sister Mary Irene Fitzgibbon. Sister Irene was born in England. She became a nun after a serious illness in her late 20s. She ran the foundling from its inception to the day she died in 1896. Her co-founder, Sister Teresa Vincent, took over as the directress after Sister Irene's death. Sister Teresa had to see the foundling through the abduction of several of little ones in Arizona and the Supreme Court battle that followed over the custody of those children, and she died in 1917. The third sister was Sister Ann Aloysius Tierney. There was also one other sister who was in some histories given credit, but it was impossible to find anything on her. A foundling was an infant or a toddler abandoned by their parents. The Sisters of Charity housed them and sent them to good Catholic homes across the nation, and most all of them were under the age of four to five years old. I haven't found many that were over that. The foundling was a latecomer to the orphan train program. The sisters heard stories of infants being left on doorsteps, in alleys, in trash. They wanted to do something to save these babies from death. So in October of 1869, they began receiving unwanted infants at their brownstone. By January 1st of 1870, they'd already received 123 babies. In two years' time, they'd taken in 2,500. The state of New York gave them a matching grant, and they built a new facility at 68th and Lexington in 1872. The new facility was an entire city block and consisted of business offices, classrooms, hospitals, a chapel, and hundreds of room for infants and rooms for mothers who agreed to stay on to nurse their own baby and one other. And in 1873, they, they made their first placement with a view to adoption. The role of the Sisters of Charity was a little bit different than most of the other women of the orphan train. Um, they cared for the infants in their home. The priests from the local parishes would send the applications to the sisters. They would go through those applications and each one would say, I want a blonde haired girl with blue eyes or I want a red haired boy with brown eyes. And they would find this, the child that best matched that application. Then they would go through, they would make tags for their clothes. They would write letters to the family and say, on this day, um, the train will pull into this town, be there at this time, and number 32 is your child. Um, when it was time to send out the baby train, several of the sisters, and they had some women that acted as nurses, would board with one agent and 50 to 100 babies. That was basically all they did. When they got to the stops, the agent is the one who conducted all of the business, and most of them were males. They had just a couple females. A good example of how famous and well-respected the sisters were is made clear in the newspaper coverage of the funeral of Sister Irene. Every New York newspaper carried articles about her death, her work, and her funeral. An artist was present. This is the artist's rendition of her funeral on the right there. 
Um, they made drawings which were used in the paper. The church was filled to overflowing with mourners from all walks of life, the elite, the rich, the poor. There were even people there who had lived at the foundling as infants. At the time, it was the biggest funeral ever in New York City. She had over 20 clergy at her funeral. 200 black-robed nuns preceded the coffin. They had 35 of the little foundlings there, boys and girls under three years old. They were all dressed in white. The little girls had on bonnets. The little boys had on flat sailor hats. Um, it was a huge thing. And finally, I want to talk about the Children's Aid Society because they had some of the finest female agents there were. Charles Lauren Brace started the society in 1854, sent out the first company of children in September of that year. Um, they were They were very slow to incorporate women, though. The board of directors was made up entirely of well-to-do men. The people who worked in the office were also men. The agents were men. And every other person involved was a man. The only women for about the first 50 years were the uh, wives of the men who were superintendents of their lodging houses, and they acted as the matrons. There were three types of agents. The Western agent was the early title for a placing agent. There were only two or three Western agents each year, and they were all males, residents of New York who had accompanied groups on, of children west and did the checkups as well. The term Western agent was replaced by placing agent, and though the name changed, the job stayed pretty much the same. A visiting agent just went around and did checkups. Prior to 1900, there were no female placing or Western agents, and through the period of 1854 to 1900, there were only six women who acted as visiting agents, and none of them lasted over three years. There was one for three years, two of them lasted for two years, and the rest of them only did it a year. Resident agents lived out here and they helped set up the placements and when the agents left the area they were in charge of making sure those kids stayed safe if there was a problem they had to go take them out of their home this was a job that began after 1900 and it was it was kind of even between the men and the women the first and probably the finest female placing agent was miss anna laura hill Anna was raised in Elmira, New York. Western placing agent B.W. Tice was also an Elmira resident, and he would return there for visits with family. When he was there for one of his family visits, he'd make the rounds, and he'd speak at churches and social groups, and he'd tell them, everyone, about his work with the CAS and how he was taking children to new homes. Anna was a teacher, and I'm pretty sure she probably attended one of Mr. Tice's programs, and it got her interested in the work. She began immigration trips in 1903, and she was trained by Mr. Tice and Reverend H.G. Clark. In 1907, her name first appears in an annual report as a placing agent. In 1918, she was named a Kansas state agent. Anna never married, she never had children, but she had thousands of children out here that she loved and cared for. Uh, she stayed in contact with a lot of these kids. Um, she, they invited her to graduation. They invited her to their weddings. I was told the other day, um, my high school teacher, her grandma was an orphan train rider who came out with Anna. And she invited Anna to the wedding. And Anna said, don't you get married until I get there. And Anna was her major, maid of honor. And then when they had their first baby, they named their baby girl Anna. So uh, she, was, she was well admired by the people, the, the children that she had helped. After her retirement, she returned to Elmira, where she was active in the Daughters of the American Revolution and other social organizations. She passed away in 1963 at the age of 84. 
and the DAR named her an Outstanding Woman of History the following year. In 1912, the CAS annual report, women finally outnumbered the men as placing agents. There were four ladies who were placing agents. The first was Anna, the second was Clara Comstock. Clara and Anna were very close in age and became very close friends. They made a lot of trips together. Like Anna, Clara was a teacher prior to her employment with the CAS. She started out as the New York State agent in 1911, and she was a visiting and placing agent by 1913. Five years later, she was the state agent for Iowa. Also like Anna, Clara never married, never had children, and she was another one who kept in close contact with the children she found homes for. <coughs> Clara died just a few months after Anna, she was also 84, and her obituary stated that she had found homes for 12,000 children. The third in the 1912 <coughs> annual report was Alice Bogardus. Alice, the Bogardus family, they did this as a family thing. Um, she was one of three siblings that all worked for the CAS. The Bogardus family was also from Elmira, New York. I'm seeing a connection here. In 1900, Alice and her older sister Mary, neither one of them were married, they were dressmakers together. 1910, they owned a bakery together. In 1912, Alice was one of the four female placing and visiting agents. While Alice was the official agent, her sister Mary accompanied her on many of the trips, and when Alice was named Nebraska State Agent in 1914, Mary moved to Lincoln with her. Their brother George Bogardus worked for the Children's Aid Society, and in 1899 he was named the superintendent of the East Side Boys Lodging House, but died shortly after he received that, that honor. Um, and to make it truly a family affair, I found a couple clippings where Alice did placements with her nephew, J.C. Bogardus. And again, neither Alice nor Mary ever married or had children. Alice died of pneumonia in Lincoln in 1925, and Mary died of the same illness six months later in Lincoln. They were both taken back home to Elmira, and they were buried in the Bogardus family plot. The fourth female placing agent in 1912 was Miss Helen Baxter. Helen was born in 1887 in Rochester, New York. In 1918, she became the assistant to the CAS superintendent, who was Robert N. Brace, son of Charles Loring Brace. And she's about the highest ranking female I found in the CAS. Helen devoted her life to social work, never marrying or having children of her own. By 1949, Helen was in charge of the CAS Farm School program. I was thrilled to find this picture of Helen. In around 1918, she accompanied the young man there, his name was John McCormick, to Bentonville, Arkansas, where she found him a home. His older sister, Margaret, who was on the left, was kept in New York because she had polio, and it was hard for them to find homes for disabled or ill children. In 1949, Helen was able to reunite this brother and sister who hadn't seen each other for 39 years. Helen died in 1953 in New York City. Another one of the rock star female agents was Georgia Greenleaf. She was a Missouri worker. She was a resident uh, agent. I need a drink, hold on, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Dry throat. Georgia Greenleaf, they called her Georgie or Gigi. She was a lifetime social worker in Missouri. She was born to an affluent family in Lebanon, Missouri. She was a graduate of Ohio State University and she worked 
with the Children's Aid Society in Missouri, was a county welfare officer, agent of the Children's Bureau for the Missouri State Board of Charities, and worked with the Methodist Orphans Home in St. Louis. Like most of the other CAS ladies, Georgie never married, never had children of her own, and like Anna Laura Hill, she was loved and respected by those she assisted in finding a home. And she had lots of babies named after her too. She died in 1970 at the age of 85. <coughs> These three women were also very important ladies in the CAS. Marietta Maisie Bass was a state agent or a resident agent in Texas. Um, she did a lot of work down there, um, very well respected. Um, she also kind of ran one of the men out of the business. Emil Reck was a resident agent down there, and he didn't like the fact that this woman was taking care of the kids that he had placed, and he quit because Marietta Bass was doing such a good job. Emily Bryant was a state agent in Missouri. She lived in Burlington Junction, Missouri. And after the death of her, she was an agent, resident agent for quite a few years. Her husband died. After he died, she stepped down and didn't, didn't do the resident agent anymore. She moved to California and she took over again. She was a resident agent in Los Angeles, California for several years. And then Stephanie Lancaster was another one. Um, she was born in Switzerland and she was a social worker in Boston and then she became visiting and placing agent for the CAS in New York, 1915 to 22. Um, she wound up getting married. She lived on Park Avenue, so she was pretty affluent and after she got married, she kind of gave up the social work and traveled the world for fun. <laughs> this is my favorite orphan train photo. It is an actual photo, one of the few that we know of, of a train coming in. This was in Blue Rapids, Kansas. And Anna Moore Hill is up there on the platform behind the two gentlemen. And it was um, Reverend J.C. Swan, B.W. Tice, and then you can see Anna barely in the back. Um, this quote from Anna tells a lot about how she felt about the, uh, the job. The requirements for a worker at that time were physical strength, fearlessness, imagination, a sense of humor, love of children, and a missionary spirit, and I tackled the job, much as fools rush in where angels fear to tread. The ladies I've talked about in this pro program are only a few of the women who gave of themselves selflessly. They devoted their lives to finding homes for abandoned and orphaned children, and then made sure that those children were safe, educated, and cared for. In a time when a woman's job was in the home, these ladies left their homes and traveled thousands of miles in their quest to make the world a better place for the wards in their care. And I want to thank you. And does anybody have any questions? Lori, excuse me, if someone has some information about an orphan train writer, or is trying to find out, do they contact you to see what you can tell them? Yep. Okay. Yep, and I have a couple of research request packs back there um, by the camera where I've been sitting. Um, I can get you that, and you can fill out one of those if you want. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm just wondering why so many babies and children were abandoned. Um, that's a good question. Um, she asked why so many babies and children were abandoned. Um, back in that time, there were, New York City um, population exploded about that time. And 
there were no social services. Um, they felt that if a woman, if you gave a woman aid, then that would encourage them to not work, so they wouldn't do it. Um, there were so many immigrants who had come in, and first generation families, if mom and dad die, there aren't grandparents or great grandparents or aunts or uncles to take care of those kids, so they'd be running the streets. Um, or looking for food, or working as a newsboy, or however they could get by. And um, there were also a lot of the foundlings. Um, if a woman had a child out of wedlock back then, you didn't raise it. It wasn't a thing you could do back then. So they would walk around the corner from the hospital and drop it off at the family. Anyone else? start finding someone when you only have just a couple of tidbits of information? Okay, how do I find someone when all I have is a couple of tidbits of information? Well, um, it takes persistence. Um, I start out with what I have. If all I have is their, the name they had at the time of their death, which is what a lot of people have. You know, my grandma, her name was Joan Ark. Um, I don't know anymore. So I find out as much as I can. I pump them for as much information as I can get. Where was she living when you knew her? So if I can get it narrowed down to that, I can find a grave site. I can start with censuses in the 50s and 40s and 30s and chase her back that way. Um, it just, and some days they don't want to come out and play. I can look and look and look and not find anything and then put them away and the next day I get it out and I find them first try. And I look for the same thing I looked for the day before. Um, you just have to work with what you have and it takes a missionary spirit. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you just have to take these little tidbits of clues and put them together as best you can. And if that doesn't work, then you take them apart and you put them together a different way. Um, if they knew who the foster parents were, I go for foster parents first. Um, it just depends entirely on what information I have. Yeah. And I would encourage you to come to a DNA presentation tomorrow. Another way. Yeah. Um, that's Greg Markaway. He's tomorrow's DNA speaker, and he encourages you to come to his program tomorrow so you can learn another way to find those those hard to find ancestors. Yes. Um, did these ladies get a lot of recognition during their lifetimes? Did the did the Children's Aid Society and other organizations talk about them and their work, or is this something that they're kind of the unsung heroes? They are the unsung heroes. They didn't get a lot of credit. Um, their names appeared in newspapers all over the Midwest. Miss Hill was in Hiawatha to set up a placement. Miss Hill was in Hiawatha with two little boys looking for a home. Miss Hill was here. But they, that's why some of them were so hard to find. All you got was a Miss Hill or a Miss Davis. And it, it's difficult to find a woman when you don't even know her first name. Um, they didn't get a lot of credit for this just from the kids that they helped place. Anyone else? All right, I'll turn it back over to Kaylee and she can get you informed on what's coming. And Would you guys like to know what happened to those two children I talked about, the portions of their reports? Um, the little boy, this is the 18-month-old boy. Um, she, the woman who came in was Mrs. Helen Cook. She was from White Pigeon, Michigan. And by 7 o'clock that evening, she was on a train, um, the Palace Cars, New York City Railroad, en route to her home in White Pigeon, Michigan. 
Um, on the 27th of November, they got a letter saying that he had arrived and met a safe, warm welcome. Um, by 1878, they sent several letters. They were returned, marked, not found. In May of 1878, Mrs. Cook, who is now Mrs. Hiram W. Bennett, called to report her adopted son, Lawrence, is now seven years old. She states that Lawrence, now Wesley, is in good health, is a good child, tenderly beloved. She's met with sad reverses, both financially and by bereavement, and asks aid and counsel is now stopping at number 20 Concord Street in Brooklyn. In 1884, she called to say that she was now living at 147 Stanhope Street in Brooklyn. She's in reduced circumstances, can hardly care for him, but loves him dearly. He's a good boy, a little headstrong at times, and will bring him to see us soon. He does not know he's adopted. Later that month, just 20 days later, she calls and says she wants to get a home for Lawrence. She finds him too self-willed and she is very unwell. Then on June 4th, Mrs. Ambler tried to find Mrs. Bennett in Brooklyn and she couldn't find her. And I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't find her either. I don't know where she went. I don't know where Lawrence went. So that one was kind of sad. Uh, the little girl, Harriet Amanda Lyon, who was um, too um, warmly attached to her brother. Her brother was Leroy. They both got admitted um, December 29, 1854. Um, their mother had died in 1849 of cholera. Their father, when he admitted them, he had consumption and he died the 18th of March. Um, in, let's see, June, 4th, 1855, Mrs. Penfield took Harriet to Akron, Ohio, and she was going to live with Mr. and Mrs. Lewis Benjamin. Um, Leroy was taken by Reverend Mr. J.A. Rogers to live with Isaac Watson in Roseville, Illinois, November 2 of 1855. Um, he did pretty well there the first few years, and then in 1860, uh, they got a letter from Mrs. Benjamin, who was the woman who was caring for his sister, and saying it said that um, Leroy had run away from Mr. Watson and made his way to the Benjamin home. So they made arrangements for him to enter a school during the winter, and then during the summer, he'd spend their, his vacations in their home. Um, he served in the Civil War, he got married, had children, had a pretty good life. Harriet um, stayed with the Benjamins. They changed her name to Minnie Benjamin. Um, she had a wonderful childhood. She was smart. She grew up to be a tall, pretty woman. Um, then on New Year's Eve, 1866, she got married to um, Andrew Wilson. Five days later, they were on a train headed for their um, wedding tour and the track broke and she was crushed to death. She was 19 years old and had been married five days. So she was taken back and she was buried in the Benjamin family plot with her foster parents. So that's what happened to those kidlings that I talked about earlier. And that's just me. I have to. I can't just do part of the story. I have to go dig and dig and dig and find the whole story. So um, that is a whole story, and I do have their whole records up here if anybody wants to look at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lori, I was wondering if, um, from your research, did you find out that there was much follow-up contact by the New York family staff, wherever that was? Um, there is. There, it depends on the area. Renee was telling me that in Minnesota they contracted out and had a state worker go around and check the children. Um, here in Kansas, um, out in western Kansas, we got a whole lot of um, foundlings. They went to the Volga Germans out there around Hayes. And they had a sister visit. And 
the way I gather it was from the Sisters of St. Joseph Convent, either here in town or the one over in Abilene. <coughs> but they did go check. Anybody else? All right. Kaylee? 